Happy Monday to you. Welcome back to the Front Porch. Time once again for another episode of Monday Meditations. I, again, appreciate so much everyone who tunes in each week and, and gives a, a comment, a like, a share to these videos. And Spending time with God's Word is never going to be a waste of our time. What a great way to start our week, just meditating on another passage in God's Word and looking at the Proverbs and the wisdom literature that we read about how to be what God created us to be, how to bring glory to Him, how to avoid the pitfalls of sinfulness in this world. So let's continue our meditation on the book of Proverbs. We're in chapter 18. Today we're going to be looking at verses 5 through, or 6 rather, through 15. And my Bible has in its heading um, this paragraph the idea of a fool's mouth. And the proverb writer does a lot of, of remarking on the foolish person, the person who the word that was translated fool carries with it a strong connotation even that of of a word that was sometimes used as a, as a slur against someone of being stupid even we don't like to use that word about someone but that in the definition of the word that's what it looks like this is what this kind of person is one who refuses to gain wisdom and, and understanding and instruction from God they're put in that category of that of a fool and often it's because of the way they use their words, the way they use their mouths, and their actions as well. But let's go ahead and meditate upon this and, and make sure we're not being foolish in the life that God has given us here in this world. Verse 6 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes, or blows, or, or striking, if you will, at the end there. So a fool's lips... The words, when you, you know, of course, we're using lips as a reference to the words that we say, enter into contention and strife and, and bickerings and fighting with one another. But then he says, the mouth, his mouth calls for blows. You ever had someone say, he got what, is, what he deserved, you got what you deserved, even someone saying that to us? This is the idea behind it. His words led to this strife, this fighting even or the the blows being landed upon him it says in verse 7 a fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul a snare like a someone trying to trap an animal like a trapper trying to trap an animal for his fur or for food or for meat or so forth it's, it's a snare it's a trap they're caught in this what are they caught in again he says it's his mouth that leads to this destruction his mouth, he opened his mouth and brought this upon himself. And destruction is a strong word. But he says his lips are the snare to his soul. Words are very important. What we say matters to God. We've mentioned this many times in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, as recorded in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is saying, by your words you'll be justified. By your words you'll be condemned. Every idle word that men speak we give an account. He wants our, our speech to be with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how to answer every man, as Paul said to the Colossian church. So words do have meaning. It's, it's interesting because you think about how God communicates with mankind. He used words. He used word. The Bible, we study the word and we gain faith. In the beginning was the word. Jesus was referred to before being referred to as Christ or Jesus, he was referred to as the Word, the Logos, the Greek word. And he is the epitome of truth, which is the Word of God as well, John 17, 17. But there are words on the negative side that bring about destruction and a snare to even the core of the soul, the immortal part of our, our being that's going to live forever. Verse 8 then says, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost part of the belly. This is in the King James Version we're reading from, as wounds. Other translations have a different word there for wounds. As a matter of fact, the New King James talks about it, as, and others talk about it as an idea of a delicacy, something that is desired. A tailbearing, we know what that is. That's a gossip. That's someone who can't wait to, to get some dirt on someone else and to tell that. But sometimes, and this is why it's important to point out the words wound in the King James Version don't paint the picture as well. It's a Jewish tradition that used that word wound. But the idea is more so of something that is, is delightful to the taste buds. It's something that you desire, a delicacy that you want to eat. And it goes down, he says, deep into the innermost parts of the belly or innermost part of our being. That, that has an effect on us. Gossip has an effect. 
you can you can repent of that you can say I'm sorry I shouldn't have said those things but the words are already out there the damage is already done and it goes down deep into the core it has a lasting effect we need to make sure that we're not slandering people we're not a gossip and we're not a talebearer because it brings about this destruction to those around us and to ourselves as well and it's so important that he repeats it verbatim in chapter 26 verse 22 as well same verse, same wording, exact same statement. He wants to make sure we understand a talebearer has has no place in the kingdom of God. We need to be we need to be people above that kind of conversation, above that kind of slanderous action on toward one another. We need to love our enemies. We need to love our brother and sister in Christ. We need to love ourselves. And the talebearer is the very opposite of all of that. Verse nine says, "He also that is slothful, lazy." In his work is a brother to him that is a great waster or destroyer. The idea here of a, of a lazy person, a slothful person, it's been said that it's likened to theft. He's, a lazy person is taking something that doesn't belong to him. He's, he's wasteful in that. It's also selfishness. He's not considering the other people. You, you take a, a factory of workers or a group of people working for the boss and one man is, is lazy and slothful. He's not going to be pulling his weight. He's considering himself and not the burden he's putting on those around him. Also, it's a neglect of his duty in the same idea. We've been hired onto a job. We should do that job. God has given us eternal life, the hope of eternal life. We should be living exuberant lives of, of focus on him, of faithfulness to him, not being lazy in our work but being ready and being vigilant in that action of virtuous life as well. But this slothful person is work is the brother. It's, it's very akin to someone who is a great destroyer, as other translations have it, instead of waster. It has an impact as well, like we just talked about earlier. Verse number 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. So the name of the Lord, what? there's just something about that name. The name of God is, is held, was held in such high esteem and reverence uh, of the scribes of old that they wouldn't write his name. They, they would take out a new pen and what markings they would write about God. It was showing a great reverence to his name, the greatness of who he is. There's just something about that name. The name Jesus, meaning Savior. The name Christ, meaning anointed one or the Messiah. Powerful wording in that, in the name. There's no other name given under heaven that man can be saved by than the name of Jesus. We know from Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. So there's just something about that name. It's to be held in high esteem. It's a strong tower, a fortress. And he says the righteous will run to it. Make sure we're there. When we come into that that high tower, that mighty fortress of God in His name, we have safety. We are safe. We can be safe. But there's a contrast to that. Verse 11 says, The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as an high wall in his own conceit. The rich man doesn't have that safety of the mighty fortress of the Lord's name because he's trusting in his own riches. And that's going to bring about destruction in the end. Those things that are physical are going to perish in the end. So why not put your trust in the high tower of the name of God and have genuine, true safety? He says in verse 12, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. That reminds me of Proverbs 16, 18. He talks about pride goes before destruction, the haughty spirit before the fall. Before that destruction comes, he's got a haughty and arrogant spirit. But then also before honor... The, right, the contrast to that, there's humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You think back to Philippians chapter 2 and, and how Jesus humbled himself. Here is God incarnate, humbling himself to be flesh and blood like you and me so he can relate to our needs and be a, a compassionate high priest in our needs. And so if we want to be honored, choose humility. This is God's way, and it works. If you want to find destruction, just be haughty and arrogant. He says in verse 13, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and a shame unto him. 
one of those very common sense statements of the book of Proverbs. There's a lot of those, and this is one of them. To not hear someone out, to just be quick to answer and throw out an answer, just to let me show you how intelligent I am, and you don't hear the whole matter, you may find yourself to be a lot more foolish than you really thought you were. It will be shown. This is a sad situation here. This person who hears the matter, answers the matter before he hears it, it's a foolishness, it's a folly, and it is a shame to him. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Be quick to listen to what's being said because many times we can avoid a lot of conflict and strife if we'll just hear what the other person's actually saying. There have been those times where we get into what's called a verbal dispute more so than an argument. We don't realize because we're not listening, we're actually saying the same thing. Let's get back to the truth of the matter. And the only way we can do that is to listen and to hear what the other person is saying before we answer. He says then in verse 14, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? When we've got the right disposition and attitude, no matter what happens in this life, you've seen those people before where some very difficult situations, a, a very a severe illness falls on them, but they have the attitude of, I'm going to be all right, God has me. I'll get through this, and if I don't, God will take me home and allow me to be with Him. That's a powerful disposition, but a broken spirit... When someone is crushed to the core, to their soul, how can you bear that? How can we bear through in the life that, that's in this world around us of difficulties and hardships? If we have our focus on God and our spirit is right, we can bear and endure anything. With God's help, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And then verse 15 says, The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. If we want to be prudent, we want to be wise, we're going to try to gain as much knowledge as we can. That's why we spend our time each Monday meditating on the Word of God. That's why we spend every day spending a little time talking to God in prayer, spend a little time letting God talk to us in Bible study, and spending as much time as we can possibly have to speak with others about that same God who offers us salvation. That'll sustain our spirit. It'll keep us from being foolish, lazy, and help our words have meaning and be fruitful in this world around us. And that's something on which we can meditate this Monday and every day. May God bless you till we meet again. Mm -hmm.